I'm really grateful to be here tonight. My name is Ray Apolito. I'm the uh, uh, outreach director of Catskill Animal Sanctuary. And uh, Catskill Animal Sanctuary, how many people have been? Great. And for all of you uh, that haven't, um, what happened? <laughs> come on up. Kiss a pig. Get licked by a cow. Come visit us. We're only two miles north of here. All right, we have a beautiful farm. Beautiful sanctuary, 120 acres, over 300 animals. You said two, um, two miles north? Did I say two miles? Two hours. <laughs> two miles or two, two hours. Miles. <laughs> Take your pick. Now that's a sales pitch, that's right? right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's only two miles, really. A five-minute five five walk up the road. <laughs> so we have beautiful tours. Come on in. We have beautiful tours. We have an uh, incredible homestead, a B&B up there. We have cooking uh, classes. And we're also creating these events. So I don't know if you've been to some of our other events. We're going to have many more in the city um, throughout the year. So thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for everyone who came. And thank you for everyone who donated. It's really important. It helps us put these events on. And that's how we thrive. That's how all these organizations thrive. We need your help and support always. So if... Uh, if you did donate, thank you. If not, you have plenty of opportunity over back in that corner. Michelle's back there. Um, we would love, if you haven't filled out your name and, and some contact information, we would love to keep in touch with you. So please, we'll be passing something around. We also have a survey, so we know how to uh, kind of just take a pulse on what's happening here with everyone and how best we could serve the community. Um, I am really grateful for the Animal Welfare Committee, uh, NYU's uh, department. Thank you, Layla and Anami have produced this. <laughs> And if any of you are a little warm, uh, Layla will come around and personally fan you, <laughs> right? So thank you, Layla, for taking care of this. There's a lot of work to get this done. Um, so I am honored to have this amazing panel of uh, actually really dear friends, great activists, and people that are important for, for the lives of animals. And I want to start with uh, introducing my uh, new friend here, Mr. Stephen Wise, who is the, uh, he's the, uh, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> founder and president of the uh, Non-Human Rights Project, and he just released a beautiful film, really beautiful film called Unlocking the Cage. I don't know if any of you have seen it. If you have not, please make sure you see it. It's an incredible uh, testament to his life's work of over 30 years uh, of animal protection law. He's a brilliant man doing brilliant things, and when he completes his, his beautiful task of, of taking care of our animals, our, I, I greatly believe our lives will shift all of us. People who are interested in animal uh, liberation and people who are not, it will greatly have effect on our life. He has four books out. He has an amazing uh, um, uh, non-for-profit. You should please check it out, Non-Human Rights Project. Um, also, Stephen is a fantastic singer, and he's looking for a gig you know, in a band, if anyone you know, <laughs> knows. Especially if it's a loud rock band. So please give it up for Stephen Wise. <laughs> I want to uh, also welcome my brother from another mother down under, <laughs> Mr. Damian Mander of the International Anti-Poaching Foundation. Cheers. So I, I um, you know, I have the honor of, uh, of meeting him through some friends, and what a brilliant uh, life's work this man has done. He was a uh, special forces op, big man in the uh, Australian military. And he directed all his resources, his focus, his knowledge, and his wisdom that he had gotten in the military towards protecting animals um, that are endangered. Elephants and rhinos in particular uh, through uh, animal wildlife uh, uh, trafficking as well as poaching. So he's personally responsible um, and his team of, was it 200 now? Your team of 200? Oh, yeah. We, I mean, one operation, we've got 165 rangers alone. So, yeah, there's, there's well over 250 rangers that we're supporting out there that are help protecting six, uh, over 6 million acres of wilderness. Yeah, that's it. So that's his life work. Great man. Um, please make sure yeah. you take a look and, and see what he's that, doing. Yeah. Um, Jeez, we don't pay them all. And that's Damien, Damien Mander. He's also, I just want to let you know, this man has, if, if any of you need any, like, real tactical, great ways to help people understand about uh, the plight of animals, Damien will could share some really beautiful techniques about how he uses his phone to um, kind of queue up uh, animal slaughter videos and place them strategically when in bars and people are eating chicken wings. <laughs> so Damien Mander. Cheers, man. Yeah. Cheers. Um, I'm really grateful to announce 
my next super dear friend and uh, somebody who's so important to me, really so important to me. So this is Kathy Stevens, who's the director and uh, executive director of Founders <laughs> Tech. Kathy has two amazing books. She's an amazing speaker. Um, she has an amazing sh sanctuary. I am so grateful to be part of her vision uh, and, and fulfilling her mission to protect uh, farm animals and also to educate, right? So that's one of the big things that we do at the sanctuary. Um, and the other thing, you know, that Kathy is, she's super, super excited um, to be with me every week and to develop the great <laughs> ideas that I have, like this panel here. So I'm really excited uh, for her. I'm really happy for her. For Kathy Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> My next dear friend, badass animal activist, and fantastic animal, uh, right? I don't have to announce her. Laura Constance Marino, right? So, Nora's been an amazing, amazing activist on top of um, uh, being a great attorney for the End Caporos. The Alliance and uh, Chicken Kaporos, which is a horrific thing that's happening here in New York, of all of you who don't know and all of you on the YouTube machine, it is a horrible thing that's happening here. Nora's behind it. Where's Don Ladd? Don, where are you? Another great warrior. Thank you. This will, this will end very soon, and it's, it's, it's because of these great people who are doing great work in our, in our city. Um, so please check out, um, oh, the Animal Exposure, uh, Animal Cruelty Exposure Fund. She has also had amazing commercials, so some in New York and also many throughout the states on CNN, um, just, you know, I exposing images of animal cruelty uh, to the world at large that are really important. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to my dear friend, Nora. Nora is also, one of the things that she's really great at, she's really great at taking activists who don't have, like, collared shirts and wear coconut earrings to bring them to lobby in Capitol Hill. So Nora Marino will be there for you if you need any help doing that. Nora Marino, thank, thank you. you so much. Take it over. Thank you. Uh, before I open it up with questions, I just have to say how honored I am that, oh God, that was the mic. It's going to be a big loud noise now in the recording. Um, how honored I am to be moderating this fantastic panel. Um, and I want to Thank Ray and Kathy for asking me to do this. It really is an honor to be sitting at a table with these fantastic warriors for animals. So, so that said, um, we're going to open it up with um, a question for Kathy. As uh, we all know, Kathy runs an animal sanctuary. And I know um, sometimes there's questions, you know, well, why bother having an animal sanctuary? It costs, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to run for just a small amount of animals. And there really is a fantastic benefit to running these sanctuaries that a lot of people do not understand. So I wanted to open up with Kathy, and I want to ask Kathy, um, how effective do you think exposing people to farm animals on a sanctuary is at edging them towards veganism? Um, and what can be done while they're at the sanctuary to encourage them to do even more? I don't think, for those of us who aspire toward a vegan world, I don't think we can do it without sanctuaries. Um, we are so compartmentalized in our lives and so compartmentalized in our lives with animals. And um, there are good, kind people whom all of us know. Not loud enough? No, uh, louder. Okay. Louder. It's not hard for me. It's not uh, hard for me either. <laughs> good, good, kind people whom all of us have in our lives who cherish their dogs and cats and who who might contribute to the World Wildlife Fund and who might never go to zoos and yet legitimately because of how we've all been enculturated legitimately don't see that they're doing anything wrong when they eat breakfast lunch and dinner so they must have, you can watch the films and you can read the literature and, you, and, and the movement is growing more powerful by the day thanks to, you know, the, cry, the outcry about the environment and lots of vegan doctors and what we're learning about nutrition. However, unless and until some of those people have the experience of having a turkey climb into their laps and wrap their little necks around their heads and say, I love you. I love you. <laughs> right? Because 
turkeys are profoundly emotional animals. And unless they have the experience of seeing the, the workings of a pig's mind and, see, and lying in the straw and hugging that pig in exactly the same way that they hug their dog in bed at night, then it's too easy for that group of people to slip back into old habits. So that is why I think sanctuaries, this, we cannot do this work without sanctuaries. And how I think we can be more effective Globally, we need more. Sanctuaries need to support the growth of good sanctuaries. That's one thing. Sanctuaries must have a well thought out and strategic educational component, not a memorized script. And sanctuaries need to walk that fine line between, between figuring out how to bring more people in to have the experience that I was describing without ever becoming zoo-like, without ever compromising the lives of the animals for whom that's their home. And so that's the challenge. But those are some of the things I think we can do. Right. And I think, um, you know, you bring up such great points. And I'm sure many of us have seen this. You see a dog rescue. And there's a fundraiser on Facebook, and what are they doing? They're having a barbecue serving hot dogs and hamburgers. And it's infuriating to me. And that's why I think you know, what the work that Kathy does is so critical, because it does help people make that connection that, like you said, roll around in the hay with a pig like you would snuggle in your bed with a dog. And we, we really we need more sanctuaries, really, where people will have the opportunity to go and spend time with these animals. So, um, and I just wanted to mention a, a meme I saw on Facebook the other day that I thought was so funny. It said, um, you like and share farm animal rescue stories, but you're not vegan. Do you realize that these animals are being rescued from you? <laughs> and it, it really, it's so true. And people mm. don't make that connection at all. So should we, oh, do you want to take a question or two or should we just move on? Let's move on. Okay. All right. We're going to come back to Kathy. This is like. Uh, well, what do you. I don't. <laughs> you make gonna, those decisions. We're going to come back. Up. Unless, does anyone have a question for Kathy right now before we move on to. Okay, right here. I find that when. Um, <clears throat> with anything involving animals, if we can get to the children, if we can get to the youth of America, you know, I mean, I see it when I'm protesting animal um, horse carriages and a child walks by and, the, and they connect. You're connecting with them at such a heart level. They're like so the animals. Right. How, in yes. other words... So Catskill has, uh, <laughs> we just got some nice funding and will be, we had a kids camp. Um, we put that on hold for a year to ve develop an even more, an even bolder, bigger youth leadership program. But I, I absolutely agree. Every established sanctuary, you know, when you're, brand new, you're putting one foot in front of the other. You're raising money in May to, to pay for June, right? So, but the more established sanctuaries that truly, truly are about changing the world, not just rescue, some just want to rescue. Fine, if that's what they want to be. But the ones who want to do this, right, have got to have a, an a strong, a strong and well-developed educational piece. Okay, we'll take one more question for Kathy before moving on. Anyone else? Yes. It's directly related to that question. Um, it, it's amazing what Kathy's been doing over the years, and I just keep struggling with why isn't the education of small children in the public schools? Oh my goodness, we know that. Excellent question. You know that answer, though. Teach them. There is no such thing as a hot dog. There is no such thing as a hamburger. But you All know, you can answer, answer your own question. The question. All right, the question. You let me re answer your let me repeat question. the question for the ca for the. Um, video. The question is, why isn't um, education regarding um, animal welfare or, is that your question, regarding animal welfare, within basic, basic ethics within our public schools? There is. There is a law on the books since 1947. It's the Humane Teaching, uh, Humane Education Law. That every I have heard that. Yes. Yes. And part of the stipulation of, of this law is that if the schools do not teach this humane program, they will be... Uh, <coughs> Excuse me, federal funds will be withheld. It's not enforced. It's not, it's not enforced. enforced. I have heard of it. Oh, yeah. There's an organization in, within New York City called HEART, 
Anybody know what the acronym stands for? Humane Education. I don't know what the A is. Advocates, Advocates reaching teachers um, who exist for that very reason. But you know, you've got you've got the federal government that doesn't want to rock the boat. So, okay. all right, I just got I just got scolded. <laughs> I got scolded in a note. <clears throat> Ray, okay, I'm gonna take Q and A at the end. So, I'm <laughs> so we're gonna move on. Um, we're gonna move on to uh, Damien Mander, who um, I did not know. Uh, I never met Damien before today. Um, I've met Kathy before, I've met Stephen back in 2004, although I don't know if he remembers meeting me, but I clearly remember meeting him. He had such an effect on me. But uh, I had not met Damien before today, so I did a little research on Damien, and I gotta say, this guy's a badass, okay? I mean, <laughs> this guy is just a badass, and we are so lucky to have this guy on our side for the animals. So um, I don't wanna take too much of his time, but my question is, um, he, he's, he was a soldier, as he said before, in the uh, Australian Army Special Forces, I believe. Just, just all badass stuff. So I'm going to let Damien talk. So my question to Damien is, how does your history and experience of being a soldier help your current position as an anti-poacher crusader? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. And thanks, everybody, for being here. It's, it's actually a great honor to be amongst uh, people that are so powerful and passionate about this movement. And... Uh, we actually, I don't mean, we don't need to be talking to a room of people that already get it. So if I can say one thing, <laughs> keep going, keep persisting uh, with the people that you're, you're pushing on and trying to, trying to make the shutters come up. Because once the shutters come up, they never go down again. Uh, so my background, I was uh, our version, Australia's version of, of the Navy SEALs. I went to a, a special operations unit uh, as a sniper. I did 12 tours in Iraq uh, and found myself eventually in Southern Africa. And I, traveling around and seeing what was going on uh, with rangers, people that are out there on the front lines trying to protect animals, animals that have been targeted by uh, organized crime cells that are using paramilitary tactics, uh, animals as big as a truck that you can hold what the poachers want in one hand, uh, an elephant for their ivory, a, a rhino for, for its horn. And uh, I was frustrated. I come from a special operations background where I can push two buttons in my, in my vehicle in Baghdad if we've been blown up and in a few minutes Delta Force is going to be there to pull us out of the shit. Uh, I've got drones flying around trying to bring me back safely at night. Uh, you know, we're working as part of a, a half a trillion dollar defense budget. And I get over to, over to Africa and I see people running around in the bush trying to defend the natural world with, with, with their lives. And guys didn't have boots, didn't have uniforms, didn't even have uh, batteries for their radios, ammunition for their weapons. So I had two things. I had my funding from a real estate portfolio and my time in Iraq, and I had a, a shitty set of skills. And I decided to do something with those skills and that money, and that was to start up the International Anti-Poaching Foundation. Our job is to be the last line of defense for, for animals that are being targeted uh, by these tactics. I go to work every day knowing what we do is not the ultimate solution. Demand reduction in Asia and, and, uh, is, is a big part of the solution. Getting a community to a point in a continent that's going to have 2 billion people on it by 2040, getting a community to a point where they don't want to poach, that's a, that's a big picture answer. But uh, our job is to stop the hemorrhaging, to buy time for people much smarter than me that are trying to figure out this thing on a much larger scale. And that is, you know, guys like me with the skills I've got are going to become increasingly relied upon by the international community to hold on to what we have left. And that is the shitty reality of the world we've created for ourselves to manage. I can tell you one thing I want in this world. I want to be out of work, okay? But, uh, you know, it's not looking likely in this lifetime. Uh, let me ask you, um, how do you see your discipline serving our movement? I mean, as you said, it's one corner of it. So how do you see the poaching... Um, spreading into other areas of animal rights or animal um, well-being? My, 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 my passion is not anti-poaching. My passion is motivating other people to care about animals. I walked around the bush for three years protecting one animal and then I came home at night and I put another on the barbecue. Okay, and then eventually I realized that what I was believing and what I was doing were heading in two, two different directions and that's when I, I called bullshit on myself and decided <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. It's true. You know, we, we suppress we suppress things that are not convenient to us, uh, and uh, I, that's what I was doing. And um, so now, I mean, I spend a lot of time around the world uh, lecturing and talking about not just the work we do, 
uh, but trying to you know, be a voice for the voiceless, speaking on behalf of all animals. And I, I, I used to be a hunter. I used to be a person that had oh zero respect for, for animals or the environment. Uh, you know, you know, and I was the worst type of hunter. I was the type that did it for fun, not even for food. You know, so I can, I can speak to those people. I can look them in the eye and I can reach them because uh, I used to be one of them. And so I think, you know, this movement has people of all different shapes and sizes and backgrounds. And, you know, our, our, you know, our, our, you know, our um, weaknesses, uh, are what, our vulnerabilities are what make us human. And, you know, my past helped shape who I am today and open up my eyes to the, the, the wonder of animals and their desperate need for protection in all walks of life. And so, you know, I, I can speak to a, 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 a young guy, you know, a teenage guy. I can speak to a hunter. You know, I can speak to those people because I used to be that disturbed young kid that, that never gave a shit about animals. Well, that, that's a very good point because if yeah. I try to speak to a hunter or if Victoria tries to speak to a hunter, they're, they're not going to listen. I'm sorry, my glasses yeah. broke on the train. <laughs> they're, yeah. so, yeah. they're, <laughs> they're not going to listen. But if have a guy been, like... Have you been fighting in the subway again? <laughs> it was Ray. It was Ray. We yeah. had a bar... No, I'm kidding. Yeah. But if a guy like Damien comes up to Hunter, he's got a much better chance of reaching that Hunter than any of us do because he's been a Hunter. And I noticed a common thread and actually something you both said about you know, people making that connection. Like you were, you're out there protect, protecting one animal and then going home and eating another. Yeah. One person's out there saving a dog and then throwing a fundraiser and eating a hamburger. Yeah. So there's this huge disconnect. So even people who claim to love animals and claim to care about animals, and they may actually believe in their hearts and their minds that they do, they're not making that connection. And I think that's a job that we all um, have before us. It's Melanie Joy's carnism. Mm -hmm. Correct. It, that's what it is. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so this brings us, speaking of making the connection, to another esteemed speaker, Stephen Wise. Um, founder and president of the Non-Human Rights Project. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with his work. Um, I'll let Stephen uh, give a little background and then I'm going to ask you a question about it. Fair enough? Sure. Well, about uh, 32 years ago now, uh, I had been practicing animal welfare law. I had been practicing animal welfare law for f five or six years and, and I realized uh, that I was never going to make any serious inroads in being able to protect the fund fundamental interests of any non-human animals uh, because they were seen as legal things. They lacked the capacity for any sort of legal rights in our Western system, probably the Eastern systems as well. <clears throat> Hold on, okay, I gotta go louder. There's, and, okay, uh, you know, I'm actually, the way I do it, I'm actually, uh, you, I'll probably stand up if that's all right, yeah. Yes. I actually was, uh, was invited to speak last week uh, at the California Supreme Court, believe it or not. And uh, the justice who was interviewing me in front of the audience, had a, he brought up two easy chairs and he said, sit down and talk. I said, I can't talk about serious things sitting down in the easy chair. So if you don't mind, I'll stand up. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. So I'm standing up. Um, so uh, it turns out that non-human non animals are considered to be legal things. They lack the capacity for any sort of legal rights. They're the slaves of persons. They're invisible to civil law. On the other hand, persons have the capacity for an infinite number of rights. You know, we, they, we are the masters of, of, of all things and we're highly visible to civil law. So I realized that that was going to have to, to change, that, that uh, we could not really do something that would, would protect any, any of the fundamental interests of any non-human animals uh, in any kind of a permanent way until they were seen as being rights bearers themselves. Uh, so that was 1985. Uh, I, at that point, I predicted that it would take 30 years before we'd be able to file the first lawsuits in 2015. Turned out I was unduly pessimistic. We only took 28 years. Uh, <laughs> filed suit in 2013. And the Non-Human Rights Project then has just begun uh, you know, filing lawsuits in, where, in which we are demanding that uh, judges recognize that non-human animals, beginning with the chimpanzees who we are representing, uh, should... Uh, should be legal persons whose most fundamental right, the right to bodily liberty, not to be imprisoned, you know, should be respected. And uh, we're about to file lawsuits on behalf of, of elephants. Um, we've been telling SeaWorld uh, we're, we're, we're coming after you on, on behalf of workers. And, uh, and then there's other non-human animals uh, at, 
as well. We're, we're working now with, uh, with folks all, all over the world uh, who are also trying to do the same thing. And in fact, there's a group in Argentina who actually beat us to it. They, they really um, took our ideas, which was, which was great. And uh, in November of 2016, f four months ago, a judge uh, did issue a writ of habeas corpus and, and, uh, uh, and said that a, a uh, chimpanzee named Cecilia was a non-human person. And <laughs> and ordered her freed from the zoo in Mendoza and sent to a, a, a sanctuary in Brazil. So the, I, the, the arguments we have are really good. The facts we have are really good. And it just takes a while sometimes for judges to get used to what we're asking for because uh, after all, uh, as long as there have been law, you know, for more than 2,000 years since Roman times, non-human animals have always been things. And so it's, it's, we don't expect to go in and start changing the world immediately. It's kind of like, trying to stop like an oil tanker. You, had to, you have to first kind of stop the momentum and then begin to t turn it around. And we're actually uh, do doing that. So uh, we're, we're really, really happy about that and, uh, and can see, uh, and can, can see that, uh, that things are happening. Um, we wish that happened a little bit faster inside the courtroom. Um, and that's because judges can oftentimes be you know, rather con conservative. Um, in the, when I was here, Last month, to argue in front of the first department in New York, um, we had a uh, a company who checks uh, where articles about our work are are showing up, and the the that company came back and said that in the week in which we argued that we were that almost a thousand articles appeared all over the world, including the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Kremlin Express. You know, so Donald Trump probably had it read to him, and so <laughs> so we uh, we. So you know, so it's it, it's really almost almost a thousand articles, and so uh, I actually wrote an, an op-ed piece saying that the Non-Human Rights Project has catalyzed this national, international, you know, argument over whether a non-human animal should be a person that's occurring everywhere except the courtrooms in which I'm standing, and so uh, uh, we are trying to change that and get the judges to be able to engage with us in a much more sophisticated level, you know, than they have so far. Yeah, and I just want to. <laughs> I want to I want to just say Stephen is really doing groundbreaking legal work and um, I'm also an attorney and it's it's incredibly frustrating I mean what he says about you know the law of viewing animals as things or property it, it's it's just shocking and I, I've had clients come up to me you know if, if, if a person gets hurt you know you can sue for pain and suffering um, but if your dog gets killed and you want to sue for maybe emotional damages you can't the, the law will look at that dog the same way the law looks at a table like literally a table how much is that table work? Two in, worth $200. Well, how much did you pay for your dog? $150 at, at the shelter? Well, that's what you can get, $150. I mean, it's really um, pathetic. I don't know what other words to use. It, it's, it's just like so backwards. And what Stephen's doing to try to bring this to light is um, it's groundbreaking work uh, from a legal perspective and from an animal, and from an animal rights perspective. So I want to ask you, Stephen, um, you, you started with a chimpanzee, and that mm -hmm. is obviously probably the best choice because they are the most relatable to humans as far as the uh, our DNA similarities and probably the, uh, the best shot at making a successful argument to a court but um, assuming you were successful or when you will be successful let me rephrase that Indeed. when he is successful when he is successful it's coming it's coming fast um, how much of a leap do you think it will be to get people to consider other species as um, deserving of the right of personhood. I mean, and not just dogs and cats, but you know, zoom animals, farm animals, and even fish. I mean, a lot of people think fish don't even count for some reason because because their bodies are so different than ours, and they live in a different environment. So clearly, they just don't even count. So how how do you see the road progressing to those other species? Well, one one thing that we have been, you know, trying to um, make clear to the to the courts and and to others is that there really is no connection. Uh, between who's a person and biology, you know, any entity can be a person, and in fact, we're being that is being proven uh, time and time again. It's even over the last six months, in the last six months, um, New Zealand uh, designated the the uh, Wanganui River a person, a national park a person. Uh, uh, last month, an Indian high court in one of the states designated the Ganges River a person. Our corporations uh, are people. The, the glaciers <laughs> that feed the Ganges River was de were de de designated persons. Um, it's a, uh, 
Hindu, uh, Muslim, I'm sorry, Hindu idols, mosques, the holy books of the Sikh religion, all these things have in common law countries, in English speaking countries, have been de de designated as persons. So they're clearly, and the New York Court of Appeals agrees with us, there's no connection between biology and personhood. And that's something that, that most judges do not grasp. In, in fact, when, when we walk into a courtroom at the trial level, uh, if they look at our memoranda, the first thing we'd say is that being human and being a person are not synonymous. And most judges and m most lawyers kind of intuitively think that they are synonymous. So that's the first thing we have to do is to sever the alleged connection between, uh, between biology and personhood. A personhood is a decision that's made. Each jurisdiction decides who's going to be a person based upon public policy and moral principle. And that's it. That's how you make that kind of a decision. And so our job then is to go in front of a court, whoever we're trying to argue ought to be a person, and make arguments from public policy and moral principle. And the way we do that is we before we go into a jurisdiction, we try to understand what the values are of the judges in that jurisdiction uh, with, with respect to the common law. And instead of, we, we don't come in with our own arguments, our own values, we say, you say you believe in this, and we are now gonna, we then, then position and frame our arguments to the court in terms of the values and principles that they already say that they believe in. And that is why we're going to win. Whatever, whenever we can do that in, in a jurisdiction, um, the judges ultimately, after they finish throwing us out of court because of this procedural issue, <laughs> that procedural issue, it's um, because part of the reason that they're doing it is because they don't have to reach the core issue of can, is the non-human plaintiff in front of her, you know, is he a person? And most courts do not yet want to reach that, but ultimately they, they will, and then because we're making the arguments in terms of the values and principles that they already say they accept, they're ultimately either going to have to take that back and say, we don't accept those principles such as liberty and, and equality, or they're going to have to say, we do, but we're just kind of going to arbitrarily exclude you. And that kind of arbitrariness and irrationality is not legally stable. We may have to endure it for some time, but it will change. Uh, or they have to say, you're right, you win. So when Stephen goes into court every day and makes these arguments, not every day, but he goes, his job is to go into court and make these arguments with personhood. Now, Kathy, you on your sanctuary, you obviously, when you have people visit your sanctuary, you're also making an argument. You're trying to make these people understand that, no, this pig is not different from your dog. So <laughs> how successful do you feel you are making your arguments to your audience? I have the animals right there beside me. Right, and, and when you have the animals right there and the chickens running up for affection, right? And, the, and, and every now and then the chicken who knows his name and you say, Peabody, goes, <laughs> come trucking up just as if you'd said Murphy to your dog, right? When you've got the animals, <laughs> When you've got the animals, A, right, and B, you, you've got people with open hearts or they wouldn't be there because they know we're not a zoo. They're not coming to a zoo, right? So if it's already somewhat easy. You got one foot in the door. You got, you got a foot in the door. Right. So we start from a couple principles with which nobody, not even a hunter, not even the person who might come to the sanctuary, not, not even the person who might come to the sanctuary and then go to McDonald's afterwards, nobody's going to disagree with a couple principles, right? Everybody's an individual. We always say 10 chickens are as different as 10 people, right? You got the shy one. You guys who've heard my talks, you've heard me say, you got the shy one, you got the bold one, you got the, the sassy one, you got the not, not the sharpest knife in the drawer one, you got, <laughs> right, it's, et cetera, just as in any group of people. So we're all very much individuals and you see that on sanctuaries, it's obvious. Number two, uh, animals have rich emotional lives and nobody who has lived with a dog or a cat or a rabbit or an iguana or any other companion animal is going to debate that and so you 
point out, if, a, if you don't already have the animals who are approaching you and seeking your attention and affection, which they always do on a, on a tour, um, then you point out the bonds between the animals, right? So they, I defy a tour, anybody on a tour, to name an emotion that we feel that animals don't. And people can't do it. Some, sometimes people will say, well, animals aren't greedy. Yes, they are. At dinner time, they're greedy. At bedtime, the pigs steal the straw from the other pig's bed and take it to make their bed bigger. Some do. Some are kinder than that, but some do. Um, uh, number three, number three, we all move toward joy and away from suffering. And number four, nobody will argue that, that pain and terror and suffering and fear feel any different to a cow than they do to you. And so it's a matter of, on a sanctuary, in my view, having the nimbleness to know your audience, how much or how little is this person willing to take in. There are people who come and they're a little bit defended and to get on the vegan thing is going to send them running for the hills. So with those people, you hold their hands and you speak the truth very gently and you leave out some of the details, but you tell the truth, right? But you mostly, in those cases, in my view, let the animals do the talking. But I think because we've got those two things, we've got those animals, those beautiful animals, and we've got good people coming down the driveway, it's not as hard as people might think. Okay, and I would... Doesn't mean everybody goes out right. the driveway vegan. Right. That's culture, but they're, that's but habit, they're more that's receptive, lack of They're, they're more absolutely receptive more receptive than, than a judge who's just, you know, by the luck of they're the drawer is on your, sitting on your, your case. And I'm thinking for Damien, you probably have the toughest audience. Um, when you're trying to convince um, a hunter or a poacher that this is the wrong thing to do, what, how do you do that and what is your success rate? Yeah, I mean, uh, from the poaching side, I mean, the people that, that are out there hunting animals, these are, these are the same elements that are involved. This is organized crime. The ideological convenience of a poor African living in a mud hut does not apply very often to what we are trying to stop. These are the same syndicates involved with child prostitution, guns, drugs, and human trafficking. Ivory and rhino horn are just another, another currency. So the whole vegan argument over there is, is, is lost when someone is actually, you know, at, at such a high level in terms of exploitation of animals. Uh, you know, so our job is just to protect these, these animals uh, in the field, in their natural environment. We, we develop strategies that protect the hardest animal in an ecosystem uh, to protect animals that are being targeted uh, by the most aggressive tactics because of their values uh, to, to poachers, and they are elephant and rhino. But we're not an elephant and rhino organisation. We, we're, we're an organisation that is trying to hold on to as much of the natural world as possible. We do this by protecting those two animals. And when we do it, entire ecosystems are looked after. And within those ecosystems are hundreds of thousands, millions of little creatures, little animals, birds, lizards, fish, uh, big mammals, small mammals, vertebrates, invertebrates, uh, the trees, the rivers, all that is being protected because we develop our strategies around those two species. And that is, uh, that's our dance space in, in, in this, whole, uh, this whole movement. You know, these are, these are, you know we, we have a team which is uh, largely made up at, of, at management level of ex-military personnel. And that is our job with the skills we have is to go out and, and defend animals in these environments. Um, the, the, I mean, there, there's not, there's not a, veganism is not a huge movement on the African continent. I know Africa is not a country, but you know, there's, there's 56 different countries there, all with a different political and social and economic uh, uh, issues. So it's, it's, you know, I do try and get, get my word out there uh, with, with people over there and particularly with hunters as well. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very thick veneer to try and break through and I know it's thick because I know what it took me to break down the bullshit barrier that I had and it took years and it took years and it took years and uh, eventually it came down. I can't ask someone to go to Iraq uh, for 12 tours, uh, spend a year in South America trying to find themselves and then uh, end up on the front lines 
uh, in Africa for, for three years before the, before the shutters come up. I can't ask every person to do that. So I, you know, I need to keep improving my tactics in, in, in breaking through that veneer uh, with, with, with hunters. And, and I mean, with poachers, it's, it's, it's different. You know, their job is to poach, our job is to stop them. Uh, they need to be right once, we need to be right 100% of the time. And when we're wrong, when we put everything that we can do into protecting these animals and, and these poachers get it right once, an animal dies, and that is that is we can't we can't even sit back and reflect on that because the next people are coming through the wire uh, to hunt the next group of animals. They're carrying automatic weapons and heavy caliber rifles, and it, it's a war on the ground there. Do you, you get a lot of support from the local communities? Uh, we we employ a lot of the rangers that uh, that work for us from the local communities, and uh, we have very good intelligence networks set up within the local communities that uh, act as a, the, you know, the first layer of defense for, for what we're trying to achieve in these, uh, these wilderness areas. So that's, that's uh, we, we, when I started the organization, I tried to do a bit of everything, a bit of community work, a bit of demand reduction, research and development. And then I figured, you know, this is my skill set. And instead of trying to do five, six different things and doing the mediocre, I'm just gonna choose one thing and be really good at it. So what we do is we partner with organizations that specialize in community work as much as we specialize in protecting these animals with the paramilitary skills that we've got uh, in the natural environment. We, so we, we won't go into an area and start working if there isn't community initiatives happening on the outside because ultimately that, that is the answer. I can write on the back of a bus ticket what it takes to protect animals inside these, these, these reserves. Okay, we've been having the conversation for decades of what it's gonna to take to get these communities to understand the long-term preservation of wildlife may be more important than food on the table tonight. I don't know the answer to that. And I don't think we're any closer now than what we were five decades ago in, in finding that answer. And this is not a, a, a Zimbabwe problem, it's not a Mozambique problem, it's not an African problem. This is a global situation we have. We, we're smart enough as a species to, to discuss, um, you know, or to desex our cats and dogs. Uh, but we struggle with the, the ethics of, of discussing human population growth on a global scale. And that, that is ultimately one of the big issues we face. It seems to me that the common thread I'm hearing amongst all these panelists is, is the audience, whether it's the, the judges, whether it's the poachers, whether it's the visitors, it's the audience. The audience, um, and, the, and another, the common thread here is that we're always trying to break down, as uh, Damien put it, the veneers. I like that word. The, you said the veneers? Yeah, yes. Veneers. Um, and another thing you just said was... And the bullshit. A couple of times. <laughs> That's the legal term. Um, and another thing, I'm just going to steal a line from you, Damon. You said you're always trying to improve your tactics on, to break down those veneers. And, and everyone in this room is a warrior. Everyone in this room is an anti-poacher. Everyone in this room is a lawyer. Everyone in this room runs a sanctuary. Everyone in this room has a job to do. And um, it's changing this thinking. It's, which, which is happening. And you know, we can look at any movement, whether it was the civil rights movement or the women's movement or more recently you know, the, the gay movement. I mean, 25 years ago, if you said that in 2016 it would be a federal law that um, you know, gay people could get married, you would have been laughed at. Yeah. So you know, we all need to remember that when we're feeling frustrated and we're feeling like we're, we're not making progress because look at these three people on this, you know, on this panel here. We are making progress. And um, things will change. You know, the wheels of justice grind slowly. The wheels of everything, I think, grind slowly. But I think change is going to happen slowly. What do you want to say, Kathy? Uh, just uh, um, if you don't know the study out of RPI that, that um, from a few years ago that found that there is a tipping point in the nature, in social movements. There's a whole book on that. Right, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, the study looked at social movements around the world and of all stripes and found that you can struggle a social movement, women's rights, what fill in the blank, for decades and make very little progress until 10% of the population says this is wrong. And once the 10%, once you reach that number and 10% say this is wrong, gay people should be allowed to marry, children should not have to work in factories, whatever it women is. Women can vote. Women can <laughs> vote. Black people should not be enslaved. Whatever it is, then, then 
at that that's the point at which at which to use the words of the study um, change takes root like wildfire. Ch change spreads like wildfire. And don't we all, there's not a person in this room who does not see change no matter where you look. Look in the grocery stores. Yes, if you're talking about food point. animals, look in the grocery stores. They're different than they were five years ago. A year ago. A year ago, yeah. I mean, I always say that the vegan movement, uh, when, when people say like, oh, I can't give up cheese, right? Don't we, isn't that the one thing we all always say, I can't give up cheese? And I always say, well, you know, vegan food is like cell phones. Would you use a cell phone from 10 years ago? No, technology has come leaps and bounds in 10. Well, guess what? So is vegan food. Yeah. You know, vegan food is like cell phones. And it, it's true, you see change everywhere. You really see change everywhere. And it is happening, and it may not be right in front of our faces, but it's there. And we are all warriors, and we all have to just keep doing what we're doing. Um, absolutely. I'm, I'm probably riffing a bit off of Kathy, saying two things <laughs> that, that may be somewhat um, in opposition to each other. Stand. Um, oh, in opposition to each other. So one louder, of the, louder. You're getting the louder. <coughs> in well. opposition to each other. Uh, uh, one of the things is is that re remember that tr you know, one thing we can we can try to do and, and we do do is try to show judges um, who non-human animals are and maybe even how close they are to humans. But remember, it's only relatively recently in history that that all humans became persons for a long time. You know, sometimes women were things, slaves were things, uh, mentally ill people were things. So it's not just the fact that, okay, they're human, now, now they ought to be a person. A lot, because for hundreds and hundreds of years, many, many millions and millions of humans were also things. That, uh, on, on the other side, we do want to show judges what, what is going on so they, they can understand, which is what what you were saying. And so we're rapidly developing ways to do that. We, in, our, in our first cases, we simply had uh, scientists sign um, affidavits. Uh, in our second round involving elephants, we, we now are having embedded videos so that when, when a scientist says something, uh, then they can just, the judge can just hit the URL and watch the elephant do what the uh, elephant uh, scientist says. Now we're speaking to people with virtual reality where we want to um, uh, say in uh, go out and show um, showing a, a a judge with it with an, an oculus, you know what it's like to be walking around. You know what's it like to be in an elephant herd? What's it like to be with an orca in the San Juan Islands? What's it like to be an orca at Sea World? Um, what's it like to be a chimpanzee in the wild in captivity? So that the judges themselves can grasp that. So it's really an attempt to to um, reach their emotions but and we, but also to reach their intellect so that's it we humans are really funny some of us are more emotions more intellect uh, we're all we're all both but uh, you have to try to figure out when you when you go, go in front of judges you know or hunters or people who come to see you you know what what is going to reach you it's and it's really it's really a, a, a trial it's a it's a trial and error and so we have to uh, we have to not be wedded to what we're doing. We have to see what works and things that don't that work. Scary. Let me go back and back to the drawing board and see what else we can do. Well, Stephen. Did you stop looking at me when you say hunting? Hunting? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it was a previous law for us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. Stephen brings up a great point um, about the technological age that we live in. And, you know, images are so powerful. Um, in fact, that's what the Animal Cruelty Exposure Fund is all about. It's about getting images out there. And we, we live in a, in a time with, you know, social media and, and, you know, video can be just anywhere and everywhere right at the tip of your finger, uh, right at the tip of your fingertips. Is that it? Right at your fingertips. Right at your fingertips. I put an extra tip in there. Right at your fingertips. Um, you can see these images of, of factory farms, of poaching, of a, a caged chimpanzee, of, you know, a, 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 a veal ca uh, cast, um, gestation, trait. pig gestation trait. So we can see all this and we can share it and we can convince other people with these images that this is wrong. And once we get that 10%, um, hopefully we will reach our tipping point. Um, I also want to point out with uh, Damien that you're saying that all this poaching is um, the same people that are running guns and child prostitution and all this, but the positive side of that is it is illegal. 
Yeah, it is. It yeah. is illegal. So yeah. isn't that at least a step? And I'm we, sure at one point it wasn't illegal. And we, so at least it's yeah. illegal now, and we have to keep the yeah. illegal people from trying to commit crimes, but at least it's a crime. And at one point it wasn't a crime. Is that correct? True. And so, yeah, some countries, uh, a few years, uh, Mozambique a few years ago, if you killed an elephant or a rhino, it was a $20 fine. Now it's a, a, oh. up to a 14-year jail sentence. But I That's have, huge. I have uh, upon me some, some, I will say, animal rights envy because I see people, <laughs> see people that, are, that are doing all this amazing work in slaughterhouses and having to you know, get undercover footage and people that are fighting, uh, you know, for the rights of animals in, uh, in, in, in courthouses. And if we see someone about to hurt an animal, we are legally allowed to shoot them dead. Uh, but you are? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there, there's a, a lot of these countries that we operate in have a, have a shoot on site policy for armed poachers. Uh, Botswana, Zimbabwe, uh, uh, Swaziland, you know, these, these are countries where if you see an armed poacher there, you can s switch your uh, weapon to automatic and engage. That is amazing. Uh, we, <laughs> what we have done as an organization is like to try to step back. But at the end of the day, I need to go around and, and, and convince people around the world that we're not some vigilante force, uh, you know, out there just, just stacking up bodies in the bush, which we're not. We're operating uh, with and on behalf of governments and the private sector in these countries. And what we have found is well-trained rangers are generally able to take charge of a situation before it descends into a firefight. But we do have that law uh, behind us uh, if, if push comes to shove. And you know, th this is a war on the ground. Uh, rangers are out there right now as we sit here in the bush uh, patrolling, walking up to 30, 40 miles a day, risking their life not so much from the poachers they're trying to stop, but from the animals they're trying to protect, dangerous wildlife. So you know, these are the rock stars in my world. They, uh, they work for a minimum salary. They dedicate their entire lives to living in some of the harshest, most dangerous conditions on this planet, and they do it for animals. And uh, the opportunity to be able to support them is is the greatest thing that uh, you know, greatest opportunity I've had in my life. And, and there is a, a the tide is turning. I mean, look at Cecil the lion. I mean, ten years ago, if a lion got shot in Africa, would it have made the front page of every paper in the United States? I mean, it really did. It was on the. That, that was the that was the Arab Spring of conservation. It was. Uh, it was a huge movement. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, so like all these little things do matter. And I, I, I just, I keep stressing that because I know it's so easy to get, to suffer from compassion fatigue and to feel burnt out and to feel hopeless. I mean, just plain hopeless where you go to bed at night and you're like, I, I, this just can't change. We just can't. It's too overwhelming. And it's not. It's not over. It's I, not I, too yeah. overwhelming. It's hard. It's hard work, but it's not too overwhelming. I mean, look what Stephen's done and what Kathy's done and what Damien's done. I mean, what all of us do, the, the activists in the street at a protest, I mean, everyone matters and every act matters. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, the biggest mistake we can make is to, is to believe that our individual efforts don't mean anything. You know, collectively they do mean something. And I know sometimes it can feel like despair, but you, know, you should sleep at night knowing the situation would be much worse if we weren't all doing what we're doing. So thank you, and it, it, it's good to be on the right side of history. Mm -hmm. I That is one of my favorite lines, the right side of history. It really is. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, as an attorney, I'm sure Stephen said that to judges. I know I've said that in, in lobbying in front of legislators. I don't actually tell the judges they're on the wrong side of history. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'll tell them. Where, where are they? I, I actually, I actually um, think it all the time. But I, I never said that. And then I opened up the LA Times last year and I saw an interview that I gave in which I was quoted as saying that. And so uh, I said, well, I must have said it out loud that time uh, because, because they, they are on the wrong side of history. And, and you know, they, they don't want to be. They, they don't want to be. They don't want to be. And I, I found when I've, I've lobbied, um, I'm sure many of you have lobbied. In fact, I took Ray up to uh, the state capitol a couple of years ago to lobby with me um, in Washington. and. Lobbying is very important for those of you who've never done it. You really should do it. It's where you go in front of your legislators and you just you fight or you, you lobby for animal rights bills or animal friendly bills that you want passed or you oppose bills that are bad for animals. Um, but I, I've often said that to them and, and they do want to be on the right side of history. And I found that when you use that phrase, you know, this is the, you know, do you want to be on the right side of history? They, they kind of light up because 
everyone wants some type of legacy, and no one wants to be the one that you know voted to you know keep slavery in effect or voted for you know against you know women's votes. No one wants to be that later. You don't want to be that guy or that gal. So it's a very good line. I'm glad you actually said that. Should I take a couple questions now? Yeah, one right. I really want to make a comment and ask a question. Okay, I just want to say for the questions portion, when everyone says a question, please give me a moment to repeat it because we're filming, and this way it can be um, heard for everyone who watches it. I, I can't speak loud. Don't worry. Um, well, let's mix it up a little. I'll mix it up. Let's mix it up. I'm feeling crazy. Let's mix it up. <laughs> It's Saturday to, night, New York City, right? I, I want to make a comment, like, and I'm from the 60s. I'm 65. It changes from the 70s to the 90s. Sometimes you've got to go through 10, 20 years, a generation or two, and some people do die off. So I know that takes time. But this is, <laughs> this, this, is the, this is the dilemma I have now. When I go on social media, when I go on Facebook, I read articles from all over the world. I don't want to say all zoos are bad. We've got our own zoos here. And it is not the Bronx Zoo, it's actually the Wildlife Conservation Society that saves animals and habitat around the world. But there's got to be a little shift. If they start talking in such a way, they can be a sanctuary. Maybe not so much a zoo. Look at how, not the zoo, don't look at how they treat those animals that they have. There has to be a little shift because right now you've got the people hate all zoos and that's it. Well, you've got to look at each zoo individually. So I'm having this problem where I don't want to get on social media no. and do my preaching, all zoos are bad. I want to get those people on the other side to change their way of looking. Well, I so what, what is your question for I, the panel? I want to find a way, or, or maybe she can tell me from the I think this point. sounds like a question for I you. I want to know a way, how do I say it, that I'm not preaching them, but I, I want them to look, I want them to see what you see. How do I do that on social Th media? Them who? Them who? People that are on the other side that think all zoos are okay, SeaWorld is okay, the elephant that... I said, what, what's a, like so go. the question is, what is, a, what is an effective way to advocate against zoos, sanctuaries, and the like? Some of the zoos Let's, could be changed for the better. All right, Kathy? <laughs> Hunter. I you, Kathy. Come on. No, I think that... Um, there's, there's... Animals speaking, like the zoo should not be dealing with elephants. They cannot deal with that kind of animal. They so your speak. question is about how people who have never questioned the status quo can be encouraged around surrounding animals, can be encouraged to que question zoos that they're not treating them all the right way. Uh, I would start with dogs and cats. I, w I would start with dogs and cats. Would your dog be feel good in this life? How it oh, that's a great don't question. resort to anger. Don't resort to anger. Domestic. I'm talking about like 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 elephants. Right, but she's answering how she would make. If that, you're saying make, how, that nobody's going to dispute. Yet yeah, use the dogs and the cats as the bridge. They're or horses as the bridge, the animals with whom we are all the most familiar and we all know because nobody's going to deny if you take somebody by the hand and lead them by the social media hand and lead them, you know, and people who love animals are for the most part good people who love their dogs and cats, right? They ch choose to compartmentalize. Cult our culture com encourages them to compartmentalize. So if, you're, if you think it's a valuable use of your time, that's another question, is that a good use of your time? If you think it is, then start with those bridge animals. How, it, how would your dog feel? Why, what on earth makes you feel that an elephant would, f would enjoy this any more than your dog would? That is a fantastic approach, I think. I, I think that is a great approach. How would, because so many people baby their dogs and then will eat meat or go to a zoo or go to a circus and go home and love their dogs and cats. So that is a fantastic and, approach. And, and Joan, it's not your job to change, not people, you know, people are at different states of readiness. 
You know, walk away. Don't, you don't need to get in fights on social media. Walk, that is a waste of time. Walk <laughs> away <laughs> from those people. Walk it's away. Joke to justify their existence. Yeah, walk away from those people and choose your battles. Get, you know, find the people who are open to hearing what you have to say. But, but it's SeaWorld. It's those very places that we're all talking about now. It's SeaWorld. It's, it's the elephants, the pro it's what Steve is talking about. That's, that's the point right now people are at. Steve's going community. after SeaWorld. We're going to be all right. <laughs> we got Stephen Wise on our side. Another question, please, over there. I was very interested, Stephen, when you said yes. that um, the personhood question was a matter of distinguishing between personhood or human and a thing. And I was wondering if you could help me in my own mind distinguish between um, what like AFCO in Afroism and Carol J. Adams uh, talks about the animal human divide, which of course all non-human animals and human animals all are animals. Us humans are animals. Mm -hmm. But that divide, that fake mythical divide puts Humans, humans, males, Christian, wealthy, on the human side, and the vulnerable populations, maybe women, African Americans, immigrants, children, closer to the animal side. Mm. And the animals, you know, since they are the most degraded in the largest quantity and quality, um, they're, you're saying they're considered things as opposed to beings, persons, persons or beings. Because, I mean, somebody here said, well, women are seen as things and African Americans were seen as things. Right. But they weren't. They were seen as less than human. Not under the law. No, Stephen was saying not under the law. They were seen as two thirds human. At, at one point, well, Stephen, and, and, Stephen, let, Stephen's the expert yeah. in that. He is the expert. No, the, the, Stephen, stand, please. It, oh, if you, <laughs> if you, um, you know, since Roman times, you know, for more than two thousand years, there's a dichotomy, and and persons are are those entities simply who have the capacity for rights who count in law. A thing is someone who lacks the capacity for rights who doesn't count in law, and there have been humans on both sides. Uh, there, you know, there are, although a lot of the civil rights work over the last few centuries has been to move all the humans now who, who once populated the thing side, they're now on the other side of that, of that wall. In fact, this whole thing about uh, this, like on, I, I, I think about this kind of semi-permeable wall where things on one side and persons on the other side, and at one time there's so many humans on this side, all the animals and the, all the, all the non-human animals are still, still there. But it's kind of a, a slow movement. It, it's, um, it's, it's, not a, it's not static. And, and one, one problem you have now is that, is that all, people think that because all the non-humans are, thing, are things and all the humans are persons, that that's how it's always been. And the fact is that's not how it's always been and that's not how it's always going to be. We're, we're always in some kind of a transition phase. Um, when, I, when I'm in court sometimes, I argue about a, a case, a, a um, Ponca Indian chief named Standing Bear in Nebraska in 1879, where he was thrown off of his native lands in Kansas, was sent to Oklahoma. He didn't like it. He came back, and he was jailed. And for the first time, someone brought a habeas corpus suit on behalf of an American Indian, and the position of the United States was that he wasn't a person, he, that even though he was a human, he was not a person, so he couldn't seek a, a writ of habeas corpus. And the judge for the first time you know, ruled that an, an American Indian was a person who could seek a writ of habeas corpus. Uh, so that, so the, the judge is always, or, you know, the courts and, and the legislatures will as well, are always trying to understand you know, what, what is right, what is good, you know, what, what, what does philosophy tell us or religion tell us or history tell us as, as they struggle to figure out who ought to count? That's really the issue. When we're talking about a person, that's, that means the legal system has decided that that entity, whether it's a river or a Ponca Indian chief you know, or a woman or, or a man, 
you know, whether you're white or black, whatever, you know, should you count in some kind of a fundamental way? So that's why what, what we do is not, is not simply, uh, uh, you know, reading something off. There, there's no like a cookbook. If you're this, 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 and this, you're a person. It's, oh, it's a very, very, you know, emotionally and intellectually complex decision. And, and it always has been that way. And so you, ha so you have to understand what sorts of public policy and moral arguments and historical arguments, any kind of argument, can you make that's going to cause courts or legislators to all of a sudden kind of make a gestalt shift. You know, one day they, they think that a non-human animal of some kind is, is a thing who, can, who shouldn't count, and the next day they understand that they should count. And it's, and it's not just us. It's not just those in the animal rights movement. You know, people have, you know, slaves and women, all sorts, you know, every time there's been a social advance, that's really what the argument is. You're trying to cause a gestalt shift in the people who, uh, who believe one thing one day and how do you make them uh, believe something on another day. In, in my classes, I teach three, three cases, for example. One is the Dred Scott case where you talk about and, 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 and we talk about did, did the Supreme Court justices believe what they were telling us when they told us how black, how inferior black people were. And I teach another case called People versus Hall, where in California in 1854, and a, a white man had been convicted of murder and on, the, on the testimony of a Chinese. And the question was, could a Chinese man ever testify against a white person? The answer was no, they couldn't. They're so stupid, they lie so much. And I talked to my students and say, that's only 160 years ago. What, you know, and judges were believing that. Then I talk about the case of Lavinia Goodell in 1879 in Wisconsin where she wanted to be a lawyer and the court said women can't be lawyers. They're just not fit to be lawyers. They're not made to be. Obviously they never met Nora but they, they, um, they're basically too, they're kind of like too weak for the whole, the whole thing. It's just, it'll, it'll, it, it'll just It'll just kill them. They if, weren't so, even allowed to be jurors. Yeah, so, we're, so in essence, we're saying in order to protect women, we're not going to let them be lawyers. And that's really what, what they said. And so I asked my students, you know, that's like 130, 140 years ago. What caused the change? How do we move from these kinds of experiences, with, from these kinds of judgments, judgments that pre assume, presumably smart judges were making, to a point where now, 150 years later, we think that there's that they were so completely wrong, they're moronic, how could anyone ever think that way? And I'm telling you, a hundred years from now, people are going to say, how could they have thought, we have thought that way in 2017 with respect to non-human animals. And we just have to now, all of us, push and push and push so that that day comes as soon as possible. Sure. It's very, very comprehensive what you're saying and, and your comment that it's always been that way, but that's not entirely the case because <clears throat> going back eons or going back centuries, there were societies that recognized all sentient beings are the same. The only difference is, as Einstein said, the, the appearance and the name. What nobody has mentioned, which has gotten me to respond a little quicker, is that no one has mentioned that all of this ignorance, all ignorance causes suffering. That You don't have to be Buddhist to get that. Ignorance <laughs> is what causes all suffering, all of it, without exception. Unless you, you go into the areas of scholarly research, philosophy, psychology, and the rest of it. But ignorance is what causes suffering. What no one ignorance has heard, causes suffering, yes, she's saying. No Can't hear you. What no one has mentioned that I'm, I'm a little bit surprised is the reason that factory farming is still alive and well, and uh, Kathy said in 10 years things will be drastically changed. As long as their corporate capitalist interest for monetary gain is involved with violence and killing, it will go on maybe forever, certainly not. Right. The statement life. is that as long as there's corporate capital interest with a monetary goal involved, right. it will go on, meaning the exploitation of animals. I, and I disagree as well. I disagree. Okay, so let, let's, let, let's have Kathy. When will factory farming be criminal or not? I, I, How many eons? Let's hear, what, let's hear Kathy's response. I also want to hear what Damon says about that because, as I said, he's in a world where 
poaching, it was a $20 fine, that's insane, and now you can shoot them dead on sight. So that's a huge leap. So I want to hear what Damon has to say as well about that. So let's start with Kathy. Beyond Meat has a 5% stake in Purdue. We, Beyond Meat has a 5% stake in Purdue. No, Purdue has a 5% stake in that's what I said. <laughs> That's not what you said. Though. That's not what I said, right? So if if Tyson said what Purdue say it again. start over. Right. Oh, Tyson has a five percent stake in Beyond Meat. Thank you, Mikey. Right. So. That's just one example of how they are changing, not out of benevolence, they're changing because they see the future. Supply and right? demand. We simply need to... Just, just let Kathy... Right. Sure. We simply need to work to eliminate the demand by appealing to the goodness in people. or, or and, and frankly, people... I, I get frustrated with my vegan friends who say that the ethical argument is the only real argument. They're all real arguments. You know, we're sick and fat and dying, which <laughs> might not necessarily be a bad thing, but we're sick and fat and dying, we're killing the planet, and we're torturing trillions, if you count sea life, uh, trillions of animals. Um, we, it doesn't matter to me why people come to this as long as they do. So to me, the emphasis just needs to be on eliminating the demand. That's far easier if you start from the premise that we are inherently good, most of us are inherently good, then the focus needs to be on eliminating the demand and the corporations will follow. Uh, that, that's, I completely agree with Kathy. I just want to say, you know, because they want to make, they don't care about killing pigs. They care about making money. Just look at, just look at the, just look at the plant-based milk market. I mean, the, when I went vegan in two thousand four, you could maybe get silk original milk. That was it. There are huge sections in every single store with eighteen different types. There's cashew and coconut and almond and rice and hemp and it's it's unbelievable. There's light. There's there's vanilla. There's chocolate. It's crazy. This is all in the last five years or so because there's a demand. And a lot of dairy milk products are now getting into the nut milk um, market because there's a demand right. for it. So that's an excellent point. And also, even with um, court cases, um, the courts will generally, if public opinion is of a certain way, the courts will follow. I mean, t 10 years ago, you could have had a Supreme Court that was all for gay marriage, but if the public all thought it was crazy, you weren't getting the vote. But when the tides turn in the court of public opinion, the courts will also follow. So it's important that we, you know, we keep that in mind, and that's why those images are important, and we can change minds with every meal and every purchase, and things will turn around. And I do want to hear what Damien has to say about this. Yeah. Oh, wait, do you um, want to add something real quick? But, well, Stephen, was, he, you said you disagreed, and I thought I disagreed, was curious yes. about what you had to say. Well, it's whenever... And then we'll get to the hunter. No, I'm sorry. There's so many times in history the that... The ex-hunter, I'm sorry, that, that, I have to say that. that I'm still hunting. All oh, right, yes! Woo! <laughs> 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 okay. I just haven't got four legs anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Steve. Okay. The, the, okay. What am I going to say now? No, you said the, you disagree. Yeah. I did, well. Yeah. And, and look, look at, for what, example, what do you um, disagree with? Tell me. What you I disagree. disagree that you have to somehow you know, um, uh, uproot corporate capitalism in order to make to to right. move. Um, you know, it, it, whenever we have. Uh, well, I look at um, sl human slavery. Uh, you know, we we enslaved humans because it was a really great financial thing to do. And yes, it, it was it it was a f it was we we, we made a, we, we made a lot of money by by enslaving people. Whenever and and we we have a history of blacks enslaving I mean whites enslaving blacks, but but you know throughout the world you, and Americans are not too. Educated you know, about anything, but that, <laughs> but that you know, there's been all kinds of slavery, all kinds of, throughout the world, right. where Christians enslave Muslims, and Muslims enslave Christians, and Muslims enslave Muslims. I mean, it's it's, it's a very complex Romans issue, and so it, it was all, it was because it was a good thing. You know, it's a great thing to be 
a master and, and you get a lot of free labor and you make a lot of money. And we've had to over, we have successfully and painfully overcome that sort of thing in the face of the fact that we weren't going to make the money we, that, that uh, we, we had been before. Whether it's men um, at one point enslaving women or dominating women in, in some way, um, he, uh, whites in, in the United States doing that with, re with respect to blacks. We didn't, we, people were able to change in Chinese, they, they changed their minds with, without having to destroy something like capitalism. They, they did at that, uh, eventually have their own reasons to doing it, oftentimes a moral reason. Uh, and human slavery is one of the greatest moral victories that has ever occurred. That, uh, that you had uh, one kind of human voluntarily give up their slaves. Sometimes it took a war, like in our country, but even if it took a war, at one point you have to understand the abolitionists in the late 18th century, the early 19th century, were, there were a very, very small number of them. And they were able to persuade enough people so that you could actually have a war and win a war. In England, it was simply a judicial decision, Somerset versus Stewart. Lord Mansfield essentially abolished slavery you know, all by himself. And it's not even just the, the, the giving up the labor. There, there's dealers and there's, you know, I mean, there, it's, a, it's a business like any other business. There's people profiting off of just the sales and the corporate yes. aspect yeah. of it. Every aspect, if, if you look at, and, and this, by the way, makes me feel really good when I talk about this stuff because in, and when I read about how every aspect of American life in up until 1860 was depended upon slavery. Slavery was, human slavery was part of, was throughout the United States. And, and in Eng England before, you haven't had people like John Locke who's writing against slavery, but he's investing in, in, in slaves. And people, it, it, it changed. It stopped and it changed. And to a large extent, it did change because of a moral, of, a, of, 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 of people's change in morals. And in some ways, so, so we, we weren't enslaving gay people, but, but uh, and, and gay we're marriage was... Them. We were pressing them. But, we, but people, people changed. Uh, people changed really fast. And so let's look, at the, uh, let's look at the ivory industry, because that, that was a thriving industry. I just want to get Damien in here. Yeah. That was a thriving industry. Um, I mean, pianos. I mean, they're not even using ivory mm. and pianos That's anymore. So what, what have you seen with respect to... So, I, mean, um, not, I mean, not just ivory, but across the board, I think, I think big change starts from the ground up. It doesn't come from the top down. It, it starts from the ground point. when enough people with enough voices and enough hip pockets start making decisions about what they want to say and where they want to put their money. Uh, but each person that's involved with that movement has their own trigger points. You know, me, you know, my, I mean, my, my journey that I, I went on, but, you know, it started with denial. It started followed with a, a little bit of research and questioning, followed by violent internal opposition, followed by acceptance, followed by action. And I think that that is a sort of common path that, that even the toughest cases go through. And I consider myself one of the toughest cases for change. And I think if I can change, then this is the message when I speak to people. You know, if, if I can change it, I think anybody can have the capacity to, have, uh, you know, want to help animals or, or something greater than oneself a little bit more. It's not just, it's not just the animals, though. Um, you know, the animals that, that are being suppressed. We, we, are, we are pushing ourselves uh, as, a, as a civilization, as a generation, deeper into the sixth mass great extinction. Yep. You know, we, are, we are doing that uh, as a society for the first time in history. It's a man-made phenomenon. I just finished reading uh, E.O. Wilson's book, uh, you know, probably the, the, the greatest biologist uh, since Darwin. And he has said, if we cannot stop biodiversity loss, uh, we will continue on the trajectory that we are on deeper into this six ma mass great extinction. We are the endangered ones. We need to set half of Earth aside for nature. We currently have 17% set aside. Uh, we currently have how much? 17% 17, 17 of the Earth's surface. 17%. Set a, set, we need to set half aside. Okay, so these are, these are some, some big issues that we need to make, and it's not just be on behalf of the animals, it's on behalf of, of civilization itself. Yeah, and that, that's a, that was a great, great line, though. Change comes from the ground up. And everyone remember that when you're out in the streets, when you're talking to someone in a grocery store, whatever little decision you're making, whatever little act you're doing, that's a, that's a terrific line. Yeah, I wanted to share something around that too. Just what you're saying, Damien, it's like from the 
ground up. Like today, <laughs> there's a lot, there are probably a lot more people in here, but a lot of people are in D.C. right now, right, for the People's Climate March. And I've had so many great conversations with environmentalists. Step in, Ray, right, please. No, oh, I'm in. So <laughs> I've, I've had so many great conversations with environmentalists, right? And and the common the common move is that we are we are making efforts. We're trying to make efforts to do it from the top down. We're trying to talk to legislators and lawmakers in order to to control global greenhouse emissions. Let's say, right? We don't have to do that, right? We could actually make a choice of going vegan was, was, is all our position, right? That's how, if those, if those folks who are, you know, they're like, I call them low-hanging fruit, right? They're right there for us, right? They want, we all do, want to respect our planet. The number one single greatest contributor to global greenhouse emissions is, is that animal, animal livestock movement. But you go to these uh, uh, protests and you go to these uh, events, and they're eating hot dogs and everything, right? So those are great conversations, I think, for all of us to have because it's a way not to spend so much of our energy, energy trying to move this big ship, but to actually empower people to make choices so that we don't have to even involve the We just drive a different ship, right? That's just something I want to make because that's what Damien's well, sharing that, about, doing it from the ground up. How we point. empower the uh, environmental movement and also how we emp empower the dog and cat rescue movement, right? Right. That's you know, the... the, the um, this is so right. And that, you know, lawyers, you know, we're, we're not the first ones in. We're the last ones in. You know, judges are, are not going to get too far ahead of the rest of the, of, of the country. They're always taken, or the world, they're taking the temperature of what we're asking them to do. Are they, they and, and when the world around them, they see, they can perceive as being someone who will generally support what they're doing, then they're more likely to do the things that we're asking them to do. We, as lawyers, come in, build upon what you are doing, and try to close the deal. Right, it's the court of public opinion first. And what, building on what, what Ray said, which is such a great point, you know, the power of a purchase and <laughs> supply and demand. I mean, I don't know if any of you um, remember back in the 80s, but Coke had changed their formula Right. And I mean, diehard Coke drinkers like went nuts and no one bought the product and Coke then went back because people weren't buying it. So every individual has power just with, with the purchases they make and the choices they make and, and, and buying the plant-based milk instead of the cow's dairy milk or the vegan cheese instead of the dairy cheese or the Gardein burger instead of a beef burger. Like every one of those choices does send a message to corporate America, of what we want, what Americans want. And it, it all, it really, it's all tied in together. I, I, I think to, to feel that we don't have power, though, is, is the wrong way to look at it. We all have power on so many levels, from the top, from the bottom, and in the middle, and every way around. Now, let's take another question. So and I'm gonna, you had a question before, but I'll get to you next. In line with that, uh, when I'm sitting down, I remember what Gandhi said. Uh, he said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you. Then they fight you, and then you. Then win. they, and then you. Did win. anyone get that? What Gandhi said: first they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then they fight you. Then you win. Then you win. And they join you. We have and to get join. to the point where they fight us. <laughs> oh. I was just hoping. That oh, I thought you were like—is he signaling me for something? I'm like, oh, he has a question. <laughs> Rid of habeas. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that came out of left field. Okay. Um, uh, Is that a question for me, Michael? Yes. yes <laughs> That's actually a good question because I bet you a lot of people don't know okay. the, the legal. Okay. Translate yeah. into Latin. It's uh, you can do it. <laughs> if you want to like the key and peel thing, you'll you'll be like you'll be my uh, my Latin translator. Um, habeas corpus means is is Latin for you have the body. And, and one of the reasons that the Non-Human Rights Project has, has used it, well, there are many reasons, is that it's, it's a very, very old writ. It's eight, eight or nine hundred years old. And, uh, and it, it's meant to protect, you know, persons who are autonomous from being imprisoned against their will. And so when that happens, then somebody else can go to court and, and tell, tell the judges that person is being imprisoned against their will. And the judge will then issue a writ of habeas corpus, a writ to... The jailer saying, you know, you have the body, you know, bring the body in and tell us why you, why you can do that. And so we file writs of habeas corpus because, because um, for one thing, they're really fast. The second, they're called summary writs. They, the whole case is over in a day, uh, either win or lose. Uh, also because uh, there's not what lawyers call a standing problem. You don't have to worry about us being injured. The Non-Human Rights Project isn't injured. 
uh, we're allowed to go in as kind of a third party because we're saying that chimpanzee uh, can't go in by herself, not because she's a chimpanzee, but because anybody who's held prisoner is usually not allowed out to go file a writ of habeas corpus. So that means that third parties can go in and, and do it. So, there, so that's one, well, probably two of about 10 reasons why we use writs of habeas corpus. Okay, I, I can't forget this young lady over yes. here. Yes. Yes. In America and um, <coughs> also animal rights. And I just feel, like this is my opinion, but I feel that like say, talking about slavery. <coughs> can you guys hear her? I'll no, we'll repeat sure. it. Just, okay. Uh, talking about slavery in humans is too different, like too different of an issue than talking about slavery in animals. I feel like it's just so different that like I can't. Like compare the two. The question is that ta referring to slavery as opposed to humans compared to slavery in animals is such a di two totally different concepts. A lot of people can't wrap their head around it and see the connection. Is that your question? Well, it, it differs in the way of rights because like people can be responsible for their actions. You know, animals. Like, it's just, it's too different. So I feel that like I want everyone to be vegan and I want animals to have rights. But comparing the two, I feel it's just too different. It's not going to make people become vegan. So you think it's a bad comparison? I, I feel that way. I, I, I let's, think, let Damien, let's let Damien take that, I please. Think, I think uh, an animal is no different uh, than a person in its capacity to want to have a family, uh, to want to have safety, shelter. Uh, yeah. To want to have access to food, uh, to water, and, and to not suffer. And I think the only difference is the difference we are, allow our minds to accept. Um, I, I understand that like, we all have the same emotion, mm. but it's also just, it's so different because... I don't think there's a difference in being... I don't understand what you mean. How do you feel? I feel that like three-fifths of person, there's no such thing, period, you know? That was somebody, some people in power wanting to dominate over other people in a way that was completely wrong, and that happened. I mean, I don't really understand how slavery happened exactly, but it did happen. The Jews were slaves, black people were slaves. Actually, hu hu human slavery, and there's some great uh, articles on this, human slavery was based on non-human animal slavery. And so that's why human slaves from thousands of years ago were based upon the way that people were already dominating non-human animals and, we, and they were enslaving them at the time and they simply used the same techniques for that that we were using to enslave non-human animals to then enslaving human animals you know i i understand that that well the main difference between human slavery and non-human slavery is that one's human and one's not um, but we don't we we don't argue that that's that's meaningful it's like descript it's like descriptive it's not prescriptive and uh, uh we we don't we 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 argue that that um, that slavery simply means that that the object the, you know the the slave is a legal thing we we just care about the difference between things and persons and a slave is just about by definition a legal thing and so we the reason that we talked in in courts to judges about human slavery is because uh, there was a time when humans were legal things and the cases in which they stopped being legal things set out a road, a roadmap for us to, to attack the legal thinghood of non-human animals as well. Now, you're not the only person who feels that way. Anyone who's seen our film, Unlocking the Cage, can see a judge who looks like, you know, she doesn't like it at all. And, and when I try to say, well, let me explain this to you, judge, she just tells me, you know, what's the matter? You're deaf? You know, I don't like this. I don't want you to talk about it. But... It's not clear to us why that happens, uh, but I think it's, it, it's because uh, when we start arguing about the thinghood of non-human animals and, and the word slave comes in, uh, judges start to become, some of them become very antsy about this because uh, I, I think they end up with a cognitive dissonance or, or around it and yeah. they understand that, that if they buy our arguments that the, say our chimpanzee or elephant or whatever is being, ensla is being enslaved, then they, they have to rule in our favor, and they don't want to have to rule in our favor, so they prefer to keep these as separate as, as possible, and we think that they're not rationally separable. But they, they prefer to stay in a, in a type of a bubble because it's more, it's more comfortable 
to just stay where you are. <laughs> and that's why every movement runs into these challenges. And that's yeah. why I'm sure the same judges who, you know, 10 years ago had to consider gay rights. It was uncomfortable yeah. for them. So that's why the, the court of public opinion has to try these things. And I just wanted to get back to the, yeah. the, the ivory thing, because um, we were talking about corporations before. How did that <laughs> change occur? Because ivory was big money. So, I mean, going back to that prior question, how corporations seem to, con you know, one person suggested that perhaps corporations control things, and we had a discussion about it, but that, that was a huge thing to say, no, this is going to be illegal, and if you yeah. kill these animals, you go to jail for 14 years. I mean, that's a huge... I don't think we're suggesting that corporations don't control right. things. Right. I think we're suggesting that our efforts are better spent at changing the hearts and minds of the... Of ordinary people who will eliminate the demand for X, right, Y, and Z. Right, supply and demand. Yeah, so, yeah. So, Dame, just tell me, what, yeah, it's, what it's brought that it's about? Very, it's very hard with policy change uh, to see immediate effects or non-effects on the ground and how that, how that is going to relate to our operations. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, big, it's a big machine that's, that's being moved here and it's something that's been going on for thousands of years. Right. And the... The, the laws haven't come into effect yet. The, the factories are slowly being phased out in China. Uh, the ivory uh, working factories are slowly being phased out. But we are 40 years <coughs> into an international ban uh, on the trade in rhino horn through CITES, the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species. And uh, this is a species that during that 40 years has been hunted further and further towards extinction. So uh, is the ivory uh, ban going to have effect on the ground immediately or, or in the next coming decades? I don't know. Uh, if it doesn't, will I continue to do what I do? Yes. If, 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 if it does have an effect, will I still have a job to do? Yes. Uh, you know, the, the most immediate way to, to protect these animals is actually in their natural environment with very basic uh, but very robust systems, and that involves rangers out there on the front lines uh, basically standing between, between the animal and the poacher that's coming towards them. If, if people keep looking for a silver bullet in conservation, and I understand this is something that's got to be fought on many levels, whether it's legislation, policy change, demand reduction in Asia. Um, people keep looking for a silver bullet and a way to solve this problem quickly. The silver bullet already exists. It's a person that believes their job is the most important job in the world, a person that's going to get up at any hour of the day and go out there and put their life on the line, and those people are rangers. And it doesn't matter if you like reading National Geographic magazine, you like watching the channel, you like going to Africa and seeing these animals in their, in their, 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 their native environment, you like working for some environmental NGO, it all comes back to one group of people. And it's the group of people that are out there right now, these rangers. So uh, policy change is above my pay grade. I hope it does have some effect on the ground. I hope it eases the, the, the pressure that these rangers are under. But at the moment, I've not seen any change. I just, and I just, I just want to bounce to Kathy. Yeah. Um, Real Can question. I just ask for my question? Yeah, yeah. Yes, Real, Stephen, you may ask I know question. you're the moderator, but uh, <laughs> uh, that um, um, is, there, is there sometimes a paradox, perhaps in, in rhino horns, that goes on where, where when you make something illegal, at that point, uh, it makes demand the demand go up, yeah. and it's much more expensive. Yeah. And so, the, so a rhino horn yeah. in, is now very, very hard to get. So when you get one, it's worth a heck of a lot of money. It's worth $40,000 a pound, and some rhinos can have uh, 20 pounds on them. 30 pounds, 40 pounds. Now, these things should be locked up in safes, not running around in the bush. Uh, um, <laughs> Vietnam, which is, a, which is where the major demand has been driven from at the moment, is a rising economic superpower in Southeast Asia. They don't travel a lot. They stay at home spending a rising disposable <coughs> income on consumer-related goods. And one of these at the moment is, uh, is rhino horn. Now, there's previous examples of, of deer antler wine, soft-shell tortoise, and bear bile that used to be extremely exclusive in Vietnam. And when the industry became oversupplied, the demand dropped off, uh, and then the supply dropped off. Uh, we don't know if, if uh, putting excess amounts of rhino horn into, into the market is going to reduce that demand. 90% of rhino horn that is already out there is actually buffalo horn. It's, 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 it's fake, but people are still paying 40,000 US dollars a pound for it. So it's, I mean, it's a very good question. You know, when we make something illegal, to, that, that, that increases the exclusivity of it. Yeah. Um, and it's and does that increase temporary? Does it die down? Yeah, we, you know, sort of... it's it's uh, I mean, you know, people try and use the the ivory and the and the rhino horn trade as a, as a, an analogy for one another, and, and they say, well, we opened up the ivory trade in 2008 to one-off sales uh, to five Asian countries, which uh, helped spike a, a resurgence in in ivory poaching. Now, the difference with it with a rhino. 
uh, is that you know people can harvest the horn uh, without killing the animal, and, and like there's a massive uh, argument going on within the conservation industry, uh, those that are for trade and those that are against trade. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what what's going to work. But what I can say is that the formula on the ground to protect these these right. these animals in their native environment is actually quite simple. Uh, it's quite, it's very effective, and it's actually one of the cheapest options out there. And it's 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 making rangers have the 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 right access to the basic equipment uh the right training uh, and the right leadership and when they have those components you, all the other stuff really i mean we we don't need to we don't need to bother with trade or or or, or cutting the horn off a rhino we can actually let them live in their own native environment that's that's my job and i just want to uh bring kathy in here a minute i mean kathy you're on the front lines at the sanctuary we're talking about supply and demand so seeing the reactions from people when they meet the farm animals how, what, what future do you see with respect to cows, pigs, and chickens on our plates? What do you see? Where do you see people in 10 years? Where do you see a grocery store in 10 years? Think about where the grocery stores were 10 years ago. I think change is happening so quickly that I can't believe it. And the evidence we have is mostly from just Catskill in particular, of course, is only anecdotal. But I can tell you anecdotally that 15 years ago when we opened, every third or fourth tour had a guy who said, that's a nice slab of bacon, oh. invariably. Or, you know, talked about going to McDonald's. And that absolutely does not happen anymore. Really? It never happens, and we've got uh, cooking demos. We have a we have a vegan cooking program called Compassionate Cuisine, and we do cooking demos, uh, t food tastings, and we're gonna and st we've started cooking demos on the weekends. And you see, you do see people um, afraid to try the <laughs> cheese sometimes to to try the vegan grilled grilled cheese, but they are trying it and all of these all of these things it, it we now understand you have to have your head very intentionally planted in the sand not to understand that this diet is seriously unhealthy number one you have to have your head very deliberately planted in the sand to not understand that animal agriculture is the leading cause of a whole host of environmental destruction awfulness right and you, you almost have to have your head in the sand not to understand who these animals are because we're writing about it, we're speaking about it, there are big organizations out there being, doing public things and writing powerful documentaries. I'm an optimist by nature. I could not do this work if I were not an optimist. Yeah. And I choose to believe in everyone's capacity to change. I... I'm gonna put my hand up and say, America will be vegan in my lifetime. All right, we have time for maybe two, two I, more. And I'm 19. We, we, we have, I, I, there's a young lady over here who gave me, a, who was begging me before, so I'm calling on her. We only have a few minutes, so try to keep the question short, please. The goal of this room and this movement are obviously have a set of goals objectives to achieve to work towards animal welfare and rights targeted at various institutions, individuals, be it farms, zoos, or hunting and poaching as well. But my question is, how do we bridge this communication gap between people in our movement, our group, and those like farmers, hunters, poachers, zookeepers, whoever, and get that kind of change in attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs that we want that you, Dane, and yourself spoke about going through that we've also spoken about, for instance, such as in slaveholders see themselves as slave owners run and then working towards legislation through that. So what do you think is the future in bridging the gap between these two people to have effective communication? Who wants to take that? Yeah, I can, I'll start and then I'll hand over. It's, 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 uh, it's you've got to keep working on your routine, honestly. It's like anything, totally. anything else in life. You, know, you, you, you try something, it doesn't work. Something may work perfectly with one person and the light comes on and it may work completely different to another person. You just need to keep working on that. And the only way to, the only way to get better at it is to keep practicing with people. You know, I got drunk at Christmas lunch and tried to convince my, my family to become vegan and that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so don't drink white rum in the sun. Um, so, but I know that doesn't work. And uh, so you just, like we keep, 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 keep working on it. You know, keep working on it, keep working on people. Because you don't, like the, the, the amount of people that worked on me 
It wasn't just one final conversation that got me over the line. It was, it was a, you know, people that had been chipping away in various bits and pieces and various ways uh, over a course of many years, as well as chipping away at myself inside there. So just, just keep working on your routine and just keep... It's like different things work well with different people. Like I might try to um, reach someone by touching their care for animals to go vegan. That doesn't work at all. Then I tell them that I'm 70 and then they want to be vegan. So, you know, whatever yeah. works, like whatever works. You just, yeah. you know, it's true. I'm, I'll be 71. No, I'm kidding. But whatever works, whatever, the fountain of youth, the health, that you have heart attacks in your family. Well, guess what? You have diabetes. This will all go away. I mean, we have our, um, the Brooklyn Borough President here in New York City, Eric Adams, went vegan. He was diagnosed with diabetes and all these issues, and he went on a, his doctor, he did an interview on New York One, that's why I know this, and his doctor gave him a big bottle of pills, and he did some research, and he put the pills aside, and he went vegan for three months. He goes back to his doctor, and the doctor takes all the tests and says, oh, I guess the pills worked. And um, Eric Adams says, I didn't take your pills. I went vegan. He's now speaking. Mercy for Animals just did. Eric Adams, this guy is a police officer turned politician. He's, he's not doing it for the animals, but he's doing it for health. And it will turn other people on to doing it for health, which will help yeah. animals. It's all a chain reaction. So we've just done a, done a, we've been part of a documentary with um, Luis Ahoyos, who shot the Cove and Racing Extinction uh, himself, mm. uh, Joseph Pace, James Wilkes. Um, and James Cameron actually are, are making a movie uh, called The Game Changers. And it's targeted at men and it's trying to take away the myth that you need to eat meat to be a man. And that's, it's, it's chipping away at that, that macho side of it. And, uh, you know, that's just another angle. You know, you've got to, you've just got to keep chipping away. You know, I mean, some people will go for health reasons. Some will go for, for appearance. Some will go for, for the ethical side. Everyone's got, uh, you know, trigger points. Most people have multiple trigger points you just got to keep working on the routine and and working on different people and that's that's honestly a conversation you have with someone now who may not go vegan for 10 years that conversation will mean something so have it okay and I'm really not 70 uh, yeah but anyway okay the young lady in the back <laughs> speak up please loud She's saying she saw my film <laughs> 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 Everyone Steven got that? She <laughs> saw <laughs> Stephen's film, but it was wonderful. Did everyone get that? Okay. I think you have two powerful things that you could do, and I learned this myself through the last 10 years. I had a film about feeding animals, and I toured at 100 colleges, spoke to students. I handed out 30,000 vegan outreach leaflets, had a lot of conversations, etc. Thank you. Listening. Listening is the most powerful thing mm. we can do. So if somebody says something maybe that's incorrect, like, oh, I support humane farms that kill humanely, um, <laughs> instead of saying, no, they don't, uh, a good approach, and this has happened a lot of times, say, I really care. I really, I, that's so nice that you care. I, I really appreciate that. Unfortunately, da 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 da, and then you go on. And I, so that's our powerful to listening and compassion, I think. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is here locally, I think there's a few great groups that are working for animal rights that people can get involved in. One is the Humane League in New York that just recently opened, so if people want to volunteer there. And I think there's probably some other groups that might want to say something, or, you know, at the end, I don't know how the panel is The whole be. room. But, but yeah, there's <laughs> being compassion. So that's, I think we'll get. And if compassion fails, a belt-fed machine gun is always a good way to get the party started. <laughs> <laughs> right? Nine, Joking, guys. Come on. Is it? It's nine thirty. Yeah. All right. It's nine thirty. I mean, do we? I don't. Do we have more time? Do we have more time? Layla. Wait, just. Do we have more time? I have a question. Do we have more time? Yeah, do we? Yeah, we, we have, have, okay. Yes. Short question. Um, <laughs> and I'll try to be very loud. Um, so I have a question about how. Well, so it's a two-part question. The first part of the question is about how affordable it is to be sustainably vegan and healthy. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of people who live below the poverty line do not see it as a alternative that's affordable, do not see it as something that's accessible. And in a lot of ways, vegan is, is associated with different sort of fad diets. It's associated with the way to sort of be like on a diet, not necessarily for doing it for ethical reasons. And it, of course, you want to have people, like you said, ethical reason isn't the only reason you want to have people involved in the cause, but I think that 
I've heard people say that it's just not an accessible cost to them because there's this idea that it's not an affordable option. Well, I just want to say, I think we all want people to go vegan because of ethical reasons. But the reality is that not everyone will. So however we get to point from point A to point B, we'll take it. We prefer the ethical route, but if someone else goes for a different reason, that's fine. But Kathy, I want you to answer that question. How do we deal with people who think it's unaffordable? Rice and beans are not expensive. I mean, legumes. I mean, the rice, beans, legumes, you know, organic nuts. Yes, they're expensive, but you. But it's it's a myth, probably propagated myth, by I the agree. people who want to keep the status quo. It's not. I don't make a million dollars. I don't spend extravagantly on food. It it rice and beans. I think Kathy hit, hit that. That's it. It's a myth. I mean, how much is a steak? I don't know because none of us have bought one probably in forever. But I don't think they're cheap. I don't think meat is cheap unless you go to you know dollar days at McDonald's, and that's the cheap meat, and that's the you know the bottom of the barrel. But I think it's a myth, and I think that's I think that's the best answer. It's sure. just not true. I can speak to that. So I have a, a dear friend who's a major meat eater, uh, and I asked him to cut out of his life, and he said, "Well, hey man, this is you know, it's very expensive, right? It's very expensive. Rice and beans are not." I actually went on. This is something we could do. Any of you could do. I did it in within 20 minutes. I went into all the uh, the circulars for all the supermarkets in my area, and I looked at all the meat. All the, the bottom line was 2.99. It was up to 13.99. All the vegetables meat? were 99 cents. Yeah, I gave him a list of all the meat that he eats, all the dairy. I gave him a list of all the vegetables. It's a complete myth, and you could share it with somebody, like, immediately in your neighborhood. All the circulars from the supermarkets have this stuff. It's or even just Google it, yeah. Probably. Yeah, that's what I did. Yeah. I Googled it. It's been 20 minutes. I got all that information, and it, it caused a shift in his life. Actually, it was about, it was about five weeks ago. So he lost 31 pounds. Wow. He wow. brought it on to his daughter and his, her, his, uh, his son-in-law. They both lost 20, 21 pounds, shifted his life. And this guy was not vegan, now he is, and he's sharing. Like, you know, he's, he's now becoming an agent of change. So it's, 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 it's really being proactive. Sometimes we, you know, we could point to books and stuff like that. If we want to be vegans and eat, like, <laughs> all these great cheeses and, and gourmet Ice cream, meats, yeah. vegan ice cream. <clears throat> yeah, vegan ice cream. Yeah, that's a different story. But rice, beans, vegetables, easy. Um. Yeah. Can I actually augment that a little bit, um, just because it is such an important question, and yes, that answer, um, rice and beans are not expensive, would be relevant to probably the majority of people that we would talk to in New York City, for example. But I think that we should continue to acknowledge and expand upon our understanding of food deserts being a real thing in this country. Yes. Um, so now, without getting too um, far away from the issue of the ethics, because that's what we always need to bring it back to the animals. We do want to go to other issues and acknowledge them and incorporate them, but it always has to come back to the animals. What's a way that we can maybe um, quickly or efficiently address those, especially on social media, who maybe lack some access? Do we have any um, ideas for that, like maybe online sources that they might have access to? Just to go along with her question, because your answer is, spot on for everything except for people who might lack access to like say produce they only have fast food restaurants and gas stations well that that's actually that, that's a great point in fact eric adams even broke brought that up in this recent interview where he said that in a lot of low-income neighborhoods all you have is fast foods you have very few stores that sell produce and the produce that they sell is garbage it's we just it's not it's in the five boroughs as well yeah sure. believe it or not well that's what um, he was talking yeah, about he was talking yeah, about exactly. the bronx so, so it, it is a thing that we should acknowledge and maybe have an answer for um, or at least other things. I they think point them to. I might take that. Is that what you want? Yeah, and I, no, go ahead. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, I think a lot of it would be, I mean, it's, it's work, outreach in the neighborhoods. I mean, I think people would want that choice if they had it. So people need to, you know, residents of those communities would need to, I guess, speak to their, um, their council members, assembly members, whoever their local elected officials are, and say, hey, we don't want 18 different McDonald's and Burger Kings and Subways here. I mean, th th that's a very complex. It is really issue. Complex, it's not. It's not. I don't think. I don't think even Stephen that. Wise can answer that in a sentence. Well, but, uh, <laughs> but maybe he stood up. <laughs> I, can, can, I, one one thing um, uh, always bothers me, and with respect to the with respect to being vegan, in that if you look at the studies, that they're they're stuck at like one or two percent of the population yeah. is vegan, and it's. It doesn't move from year to year I don't to year, that. I think and that's and fair. and there's also studies showing that people go in and out. They go off the wagon constantly, so it's probably not even the same one or two percent. It's a lot. Of, I don't know what percent of that one or two percent stop being vegan. Other ones come in, but it seems to be 
you know, relatively stable. And I can't pretend I know why. I just look at, at, the, at the data. Yeah, but I, I don't believe that data. And I think a lot of that data, you got to remember, who's, who's doing the, the um, study? I, I, I think sometimes some pretty good people are doing studies. With and the, and they don't. Those? And in fact, they wished it wasn't true, but but they're they're uh, they are, you know, giving us um, Adriano, you know, in, in Switzerland, you know, he's he's uh, he looks at those. He's he's one of my students. He's a major and you know, vegan animal rights person, and he 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 says, you know, this this is pretty stable. And he talks about the fact that that people are going in and out all the time, and that's one of the reasons why it's relatively Analytics. stable. Faunalytics used to be, who did they used to be? Humane Research Council. Who Humane? Oh, okay, yeah. Said two years in a row that 84 to 85 percent of us don't stay vegan, and I can't remember if it's six months to a year. So the challenge is how to keep people vegan once they, once they land. That to me right. is the very biggest challenge. Right. Um, you know, and we're. We, I think one. one, one problem that people have is that we're not living in a vegan world and right. it's and, uh, and and so it's it's, it's hard. you you are it's you're surrounded by you have to actually look for it you got to look for it and many people are and and most people will grow up if you maybe if you're living in Manhattan that's one thing I was going to say but Manhattan if you're living in Kansas or, the Bay Area or Nebraska or, or any other place to vote for Trump then you're you're probably <laughs> no I mean sure, there re I think there's it's there's maybe a connection there uh, and it's it, you you live in a different kind of of uh, eating sort of world and and uh, that's you know how do you reach those those sorts of people yeah, that, well. that, that was a great question. We're very spoiled here in New York City. The only reason why I think that one or two percent number, I, I just can't believe that it's accurate, is because why have the super in, in, no, in no, New York no, City? But, but why have the supermarkets <laughs> yeah. changed so much? And pr well, I mean, in because in, in New York City, but if you go in Kansas, Kansas uh, I don't think is you're going to find here from that. Anyone Kansas uh, or Nebraska who could tell me what a supermarket's like in Kansas or Nebraska? Are you really? What do they look like? I just feel like this got to have increased for there to. What do you? I, I I would, I would look at the data. <laughs> That's just my sure. my place where I come. That data, though? Is it just plant based, or what's the definition of veganism for that data? I well, think it would be. I I don't think it's like a way of life sort of thing. I think it's it's. Are you eating pl all plant based or not? Again? Damon, what were you going to say about it? Yeah. I don't necessarily think it's an option thing. I think it's an education thing. I mean, I live I live in uh, Zimbabwe. The nearest traffic light to my house is three hundred miles away. Uh, we don't we don't have vegan restaurants and we don't have vegan products uh, on the shelves uh, per se uh, that are you know hamburgers that are made up or, or desserts that are made up. We have to cook everything from scratch, and that's something we had to teach ourselves how to do. And it's often a, coming from a, a meat eating uh, diet, it's daunting. What can I eat? Where am I going to get my protein from? And like, when you educate yourself about what you can actually cook and do with the, the limited amount of ingredients uh, that you do have access to, there are a, a heap of options. And I think if people that are in some of these communities that don't have the, the, the shelves, the aisles lined with vegan food, pre-made vegan foods, or the restaurants that are around the corner that are fully vegan, if they can be educated about how they can make the, uh, make the most of what they have access to, and then I think uh, maybe more people could stay that I way. I think something's going on because, because, as you're saying, there's a very high percentage of people, probably even in Manhattan, who are moving in and out of being being vegan. And I don't know why they do it. Um, there must be data on that. I, they, I, I just don't know why. I don't even know if there is data. It's a, it's a hard there, thing. No, there is. There, 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 there is. There's more people checking into this than you might you might imagine. Who, All right, let's uh, let's get a question, yeah, I uh, Joyce. I think that's a very legitimate. Speak up, Joyce, please. Yeah. My, my thought on people going in and out of veganism in the Manhattan city, I think that support for them is really important because Stephen just said we're not living right. in a vegan world. So I've met a lot of people who go vegan or are convinced by me or others to do it, and then none of their friends are vegan or none of right. them work in That's vegan. My point. And it's hard for them. And of course, if they had a full commitment to the animals, maybe they would stick with it no matter how hard it is. But people may not all be there yet, but they want to. So I think vegan support groups are really important and inviting people who just went vegan into your vegan community. And one other point I would make too is that if that person tells you or you hear that they sort of quote slipped, they should not be judged at all. Absolutely. No, no, absolutely. Quite the opposite. Vegans judge? But a lot of people 
No, and Joyce, that's a great point. That's a great point. I, I, I had an affair with cheese. <laughs> like I, I mean, I, yeah, guilty, you know, yeah, some people do slip. Now, that is a really good point. It's I just, how you get back up after you slip. I want to just take, you know, 30 seconds, we're, we're running late. Um, there, I remember seeing a Facebook thread once where this um, young woman had just become vegan, and, and she posted on uh, some page, some thread somewhere that she, the only thing she's having a hard time giving up is yogurt because she needs the probiotics because she has some type of a stomach issue. And I swear to God, it was like, yeah. like uh, people, people swooped on, on her. Yeah. I mean, criticizing her, and she wasn't a real vegan. And, and I private messaged her, like, oh, my, you, um, you should be so proud of what you've done. Don't listen to these people. And, and it, I mean, someone's going to get attacked like that. And Joyce brings up a really good point. I'm going to be like, screw this. What am I doing this for? I'll just, you know, I don't want to be part of this. So it's very important that we encourage every single person, every single step. And if they have a hard time giving up cheese, buy them some chow slices or something and show them that there's some great things out there. But we must be encouraging and never Never be critical, and that's a very important point. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and we do not have this great amount of big uh, stuff in the Bronx so yeah. like yeah. you have in Manhattan. No, we don't. There isn't a great amount of milk. Uh, right. None of that stuff in the Bronx. Right. Well, there, is, there are a couple of great websites. There's veganessentials.com, there's veganstore.com, and both of those are great. They're online shopping stores. The, my only problem with them is that it's too much packaging, so please recycle everything. But um, you can get just about anything through either of those websites. So you can keep that in mind and, and pass that information on. So if you just ask the places where you shop, if they would start ordering the vegan... Another great point, uh, Victoria just brought up, requested in stores. Re and tell your friends to request. And if they have one of those little suggestion box boxes, change your handwriting and put it in like a whole bunch of different times. All right, I think we're, all right, I think we're out of time. I want to thank my fabulous panel and our fabulous moderator. And I want to thank Ray for putting this together. Please, a round of applause for Ray. He really did an outstanding job. I'm so sorry. Wait, we got one. Stephen wants the last word. Last word. We got to stand. Oh, it's just, it's just that if, if you're interested in working with the Non-Human Rights Project or want us to know you're there, um, just uh, text uh, 52886-UNLOCK. 52886-UNLOCK. And yes, 52886-UNLOCK, and then we'll have you. <laughs> so I, want, I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank the whole panel. I want to thank Nora. Thank you all for coming. I, I've learned so much. Everyone had a good time. Got yeah. some good yeah. juice. Yeah. Um, I wanted to share just a little bit um, about the sanctuary. Please go in the back. If you could support us in any way, support any of these organizations, please. We, uh, we thrive and give you this uh, content based on your, your support. And Dave, just stand up and just give your shout out, a shout out for your organization. Please. Yeah, we're not going to ask you to pick up an AK-47 and come live in a tent <laughs> uh, to defend these animals. We'll do that for you. What we do need is a growing family around the world that understand that uh, the most immediate way to, to protect these animals is, is, a, is a good person with a gun out there in the bush uh, risking their life. Uh, just Google anti-poaching. And uh, we'll come up there. Uh, it's the International Anti-Poaching Foundation. Our executive director, Alex Earl, will be up the back with uh, some flyers. Uh, so you can grab, grab some information there and have a look on the website and, and yeah, learn a little bit about what these, uh, these rangers are doing to hold on to the natural world. So, thank you. So Nora, share your... The Animal yeah. Cruelty Exposure Fund. We get commercials out on the air. We're currently airing our fourth commercial on CNN and New York One. It shows actual images of farm factory animals in cages and encourages people to go vegan. We're also airing down south right now in North Carolina on CNN. And we're currently fundraising to get our fifth commercial on the air. These bills are expensive expensive, but we we're trying to combat the meat, dairy, and egg industries, false advertising, and lies, and all donations go to help pay the media bill. So please, animalcruelteexposurefund.org. Thank you all for coming. Come visit Catskill, guys. Thanks for being here.